All right, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Almighty God in heaven, we approach your throne of grace this morning. Blessed to have an opportunity once again to study a portion of your word, to look into the life of your Son and our Savior. Father, we pray for our time together, that it would be an encouragement, that we might be lifted up by our studies and by uh, the presence of one another, so that as we go into this miserable old world, that we can be a, a light, that we can be an example, not for ourselves, but so that when others look at us, they see your son and that they see the cross and, and they see Christ in us. Father, we pray for those of our number who are unable to be here, those that are, that are traveling. We ask that your, your mercies would be with them, and if it's in your will that they would be returned to us, that we can all glorify you together as, as one family. Father, we pray for the spiritually weak, those that need our encouragement, those that need our strength. We know that we who are strong are to uh, lift up those that are weaker. We're to bear one another's burdens and, and fulfill that law. And so we pray that we would recognize their weakness, that we would reach out to them, that we would pray with them, that we would lift them up and do what we can, Father, because uh, all we're trying to do is get to heaven and, and get as many people there as we can. Be with us throughout our studies and, and forgive us of our failures. And those times when we are unaware, we pray that those uh, those things we're unaware of would be brought to the light so that we can repent of them and continue to walk in the light as you were in the light. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. So continuing on here in looking at, it, well, last week we, we were looking at the transfiguration summary. We're going to move on and talking about casting out demons. If you want to go ahead and, and look at Matthew chapter 17. We're going to read some varying accounts, Matthew 17. The one thing that we have to remember in Scripture, especially with the gospel accounts, now we call them, you know, the gospel of John, the gospel of Matthew, or what have you. Gospel just means good news. Um, it's all good news, right? But um, it's just the good news to that person. And we know that the gospel accounts, they were written to different audiences, whether it was to... Uh, the Greeks, whether it was to the Jews or like John, for example, a metropolitan gospel being written to everyone. And so sometimes you're going to read something in one account that it doesn't contradict the other account, but it maybe adds a little bit more detail. There might be a detail added here that's maybe left out uh, of something like that. And, and really that's, that's just human nature. I mean, they are inspired by the Spirit. Sometimes there's a reason that something is left out of one text and added by someone else. Um, generally, it might be the case in, in looking at the Gospels that uh, it's a matter of the audience that's being spoken to. But Matthew chapter 17, we're looking at uh, casting out demons that the apostles could not. And so if we look at Matthew 17, We'll start in verse 14, just reading through verse 21. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith of the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and by fasting. A couple of things um, in um, there in verse 17 where he says this unbelieving and perverted generation. If you take notes, you might want to write down Philippians 2 and verse 15. Philippians 2 and verse 15 talks about this crooked and perverse generation that's seeking after a sign 
In Philippians 2 and verse 15, the word there for crooked in the Greek is scolios. And that's where we get our modern medical term for scoliosis and referring to that curvature and that they're, they're crooked and that they're, they're not straight. Um, so that, that might be something there. Uh, but let's turn over real quick to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Just to see maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit more detail here, and then we're going to get into not being able to cast them out and different demons and angels and stuff. Mark chapter nine. Does anyone mind reading or starting to read, and then someone else can pick it up? Verses fourteen through twenty-nine. Thank you all uh, both for reading. So there's a little bit of, of detail that we have here in Mark chapter 9 that we're not seeing over in, in Matthew chapter 7. You know, for example, in Matthew, or 17 rather, uh, you know, Matthew 17, uh, the man starts off, you know, my son, he's a lunatic and, and he's very ill. Uh, whereas here, you know, we have that... Um, we have uh, a parent who recognizes and, and says uh, immediately that there's, um, you know, that there's some uh, demonic possession or, or what have you uh, that's being there. There's some more description going on, you know, this foaming at the mouth and when it's cast out, the, the child it seems to be dead and and you think about that is that not I mean imagine the life of this child it, you know he's got he's probably got burns all over him you know to some degree or another it says he's often been thrown into the fire you know so unless a parent is having their hand you know holding his hand 24 7 365 you know chances are he fell into a fire before people could get to him pretty quick. So there, there's, a, there's a little bit going on here. And now, 
What's partially interesting as well is the fact that just over, if we go back to Mark chapter 6 and verse 13, it says, talking about the apostles, Mark 6 and verse 13, that they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. So there's a couple of, so they, just a few chapters before, uh, you know, they're out there casting out demons, healing people and whatnot. And then all of a sudden there's this kid who is possessed and, uh, you know, they're not able to do anything. Now, there's a couple of interpretations uh, for this. One of them, one of the interpretations is that it was purposeful in God's plan that they could not cast out the demon. So that it is the idea of uh, yeah, how Christ has said no servant is greater than his master and no slave is greater than his master. So if they're going around and they're casting out demons and doing all of these things, they're doing the same thing that people are seeing Jesus doing because, you know, at this point he hasn't, you know, gone to the cross, raised from the dead and what have you. Then they may equate uh, the disciple as being equal to Jesus. Um, I mentioned this, I think it was a Wednesday, maybe it, Sunday, it could have been last week. I don't know. I don't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. Uh, but sinless perfectionism, uh, I mentioned that, it, is that that is something, it's been around for several hundred years, it's actually starting to creep its way into the church, the idea that we can be perfect here. And I was having a study with a woman, and, and um, uh, someone, it, it was a, kind of a group study, and someone had, uh, someone asked her, so are you saying that you don't sin? Yeah, I don't sin. I mean, just kind of blatant out there, you know, um, that uh, she is perfect and and what have you. Just kind of, and, and so, you know, one interpretation is that Christ was able to do something where his disciples even were not, that they are not greater to him, they are not even equal to him. Um, so that's that's one interpretation. Uh, the other, uh, another interpretation is the idea that we need to be praying and fasting. Uh, yes, we are commanded to pray. Uh, we're to pray without ceasing, the apostle writes. We're to be a prayerful people. But just, and just so people know, fasting, while it can be a good thing, it's not commanded in scripture. It's, it's uh, for, for New Testament Christians, it's not commanded in Scripture. Um, there are times when people fast. There's the example of Jesus fasting. Uh, there is the idea of him saying, you know, when you fast. And some people will, uh, uh, you know, that you don't make yourself to be like everyone else and you wash your face and what have you. And so some people will say, well, that's a command to fast. And that's, no, that if you're going to fast, then when you fast, this is how you need to conduct yourself. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because, well, some people can't fast. You know, medically speaking, can't fast. And uh, there is, you know, Christ, he never puts a, a bind, and the apostles don't, don't ever put a bind on someone that something could not do. Everybody can do what is spelled out in Scripture, you know. Uh, they don't, you know, it's like Peter, he doesn't say, okay, I walked on water, so now everyone who's a, who's a Christian, they need to walk on water. You know, not, <laughs> not going to happen, right? Um, you think of Elijah, okay, I went up in a fiery chariot, so all of y'all Christians, y'all need to go up in a fiery chariot. Yes, um, fasting was a practice of the Jews. It's a great thing to do if you are able to do it, but it is, it's not a command to do. Um, and, well, you know, frankly, the human body is actually a lot different than it was then considering, you know, diet and, you know, all this type of stuff. I mean, they were already eating a relatively healthy diet with a Mediterranean diet, and most, most of the time our diet is, you know, fast food, saturated fats, and all that good stuff. 
So one interpretation is that the, uh, the disciple is not greater than the master. Uh, another is the, uh, the idea of uh, the faith that um, you, or the prayer and fasting. Uh, another is to point, maybe to point out that maybe they did not have enough faith. If you look at in Mark chapter 9, uh, you know, verses 22 and 23, just to read those again, the, the Father talking to Christ, it's been often, uh, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do, if you can do anything, take pity on him and, or take pity on us and help us and there's almost a sarcasm there uh, you know when Jesus replies back and Jesus said to him if you can you know I mean I, I'm not saying that Jesus was sarcastic I can just almost picture it though like kind of, kind of like what do you mean if you can um, you know all things are, are possible to, to him who believes all things are, uh, are possible uh, with God. And that is Luke 13, 7. I think it's Luke 13, 7. Or Luke 1, 31. Or, it's in Luke. The, with all God, all things are possible. It's been a day. Um, and so there's that. So it's kind of, if you can, well, all things are possible with God. And then he gets later with, with the disciples there, and he starts talking about their faith. Obviously, he is not saying that, okay, John, I tell you what, if you go out here to Mount Sinai, I know it's a little bit of a walk, and you say, Mount Sinai, I need you to go into the ocean now. It's not going to pick up and move into the ocean. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking that those things that seem impossible, those things that seem like we cannot overcome them with faith, with prayer, and, you know, with God, all things are, are possible. It's just a matter of, is it in accordance with God's will, right? Uh, thoughts, comments so far? Um, so uh, another thing that I want us to, to look at a little bit is, uh, while we're here is, you know, when they, uh, now in verse 29, uh, Jesus just mentions prayer. In Mark chapter 9, verse 29, he says, this kind can only come out by prayer. In Matthew chapter 17, he says, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. So what I want us to look at just a little bit is the this kind. All right, this kind. Well, this kind of what? What are we talking about here? All right, well, so we're talking about demons. You know, and a lot of times when people think of, you know, demons, they, think, they maybe think of angels and, and, you know, typically with demons, for example, we, it might be, okay, we have Satan, right? The great adversary cast out and then he has all his little demonic minions and, and what have you, right? And, and uh, well, what about angels and, and how does that, that look? Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to talk for uh, a little bit um, on kind of different spiritual beings as mentioned in uh, as mentioned in scripture because i think there is a, a little bit uh, of a misunderstanding uh, sometimes uh, regarding that so really there there's just kind of four well uh, yeah there's like four we have you know kind of regular angels we have archangels we've got uh, those that are described as living creatures. Uh, we have fallen angels and, and what have you. So I want to look a little bit at them, uh, cherubims. If you turn over to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, uh, we'll get the devil out of the way first. So Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, 
Ezekiel chapter 28. And this will also give us a little bit of an idea uh, of how in control God is. Um, you, you might remember when we looked at Job, uh, it was in one of the Sunday uh, messages several weeks back, how it was often, you know, we, we tend to think, well, that Satan picked out Job and Satan went after Job. And in reality, God was the one who out of everybody said, have you thought about this guy? You know, God was the one that actually sent Satan after Job and not anybody. He didn't let him go after anybody else. Right. Absolutely. And so, you know, we often think that Satan kind of had this carte blanche to do whatever he wanted to do with Job and that Satan was the one who picked out Job. Whereas if we just carefully look at the text, we see that it's God who who not only said out of all of the people on the planet, go after this guy. And when you do, you can only do up to this degree and then increase the degree a little bit. I don't know if you could consider it increasing or not, to be honest with you, because I mean, losing everything versus getting boils all over you. I mean, I don't know which one's greater or more equal or if they're, I don't know. But Ezekiel chapter 28, this gives us a little bit of illumination into Satan. And actually, if you haven't read this chapter, never looked at it before, into the occurrence of him being in the garden. You know, we might sit there and think sometimes, okay, you've got creation, right? Everything's created. The garden is there. God puts man there. He says, you know, it's not good that he's alone. I'm going to give him a help me. He knocks Adam out, for lack of a better way. He puts him to sleep. We'll say, a deep sleep fell upon him, King James. And, uh, you know, he, he creates a woman from him and, and what have you. And so we might, and everything is good. And we might say, well, if everything's good, then how did the devil end up there? Right? And so just kind of looking at this, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, this is the prophet speaking, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you on the day that you were created. See, that's an important note there, just to pause. The angel Satan himself was created. But on the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub. So that tells us what type of angel uh, that Satan was. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified, and you will cease to be forever. So just kind of a couple of things there. Because it does mention it in starting, uh, starting off with the text, the, the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre was an actual person, okay? Uh, in historically, he was not a good king. Uh, and historically speaking, uh, many people actually believed him to be possessed by the devil uh, with how evil he was in, in, in his ways. And 
this particular text, you know, it be, it's part prophecy in the latter portion getting toward the end of, you know, you're cast out, you're nothing but ash, you're never going to be forever again. And so there's part prophecy in there and there's part uh, comparison to the arrogance and what have you of man. Now, the reason that we look at and we see this as uh, Satan, generally speaking, is because of other comments that are made in the text. First of all, uh, the, the individual is, were, is referred to as not only being anointed, but also as a cherub. Uh, a cherub, a, a specific class uh, of angel. Uh, also, it talks about being cast out. Uh, one of the, the loudest, I guess, telling things as to why this isn't, you know, talking about a, an actual man who was in the garden. There were only three in the garden. I mean, you know, four, you know, in the evening when God was walking. You had Adam, you had Eve, God when he was walking, but he didn't come out until, you know, after. And the third person that, that was there was the adversary, that great serpent of old, you know, that, that led them astray. Because after they sin, they're kicked out of the garden. So, one of the clear, so that's one of the clearest indications for most historians and commentators is, you know, the idea, okay, this person is said to be in the garden. Uh, and we know from Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, we know who was in the garden. Um, uh, the person is said to be anointed. Um, it, it talks about uh, being created. And it, and it says there, uh, let, me, let me grab the verse again here. How could I lose the verse? There weren't that many. Uh, yeah, verse 13, you... Huh? How? Oh, yeah. Um, verse 13, you were in uh, Eden, the garden of God. Uh, but, uh, but then if you look uh, later in verse 13, so just kind of the last two lines there, on the day that you were created, they were prepared. On the day that they were, on the day, that, so all of the things, the, the ruby, the topaz, the diamonds, on the day, th those things were prepared on the same day that the devil was created. And when it did that, so we, so it's all of creation that is taking place at once, right? Uh, it, it, the Bible says in the beginning, what? In the beginning was God, right? It doesn't say in the beginning there was God and the angels. It says in the beginning there was God. And so the creation account is including everything. And God put Satan there. And now we don't know, and we're not going to get into, into it a whole lot as far as... Um, gap theory which is basically that yes there were seven days of creation but they weren't seven literal days there's like a million years between day one and day two and, and that type of thing um, let's see here Isaiah chapter 14 Isaiah chapter 14, uh, uh, verses 12 through 13. Again, most commentators believe another description of how he was cast out. How, have you, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. Uh, depending on your translation, it might even say Lucifer uh, in there. Uh, you have been cut down to the earth. You, have, uh, weak, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. So again, most commentators, you know, you ever watch those movies and it talks, uh, well, maybe you don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm just a big movie fan, so I just kind of watch a bunch of movies. But you have those movies, oh, there was a war in heaven and Satan was cast out and, and all of that. That's kind of where they get the idea from is this verse it is 
you know, that he had said that I'm going to put my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to be greater than God. And that's his, his arrogance. And so he was cast out. And when he was cast out, you know, he was cast out, not to just anywhere in the earth, but he was cast out to Eden of all places. And that's, uh, yeah, that's a whole kind of long thing, too. Uh, any thoughts or comments or disagreements? That's okay, too. It was, well, before Adam and Eve, yes. Because Adam and Eve were the, Adam and Eve was the, the last of the creation. And Eve, her being the last, kind of the crown of creation. And kind of the, the cherry on top. Does that make you ladies feel, feel good? That you're the cherry on top of creation? <laughs> well, I, technically, yes. Before Adam and Eve, because they were later. But it was all part of the same creation period. Does that make sense? Because, uh, I mean, we go through creation and we have certain things created, you know, for a second. And, we, and so technically, yes, Satan would have been before Adam and Eve, but it's all taking place within the same creation week. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of truth behind pride goes before destruction and arrogant spirit before the fall. You know. I mean just like that. You know. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Okay. So, um, let's go to Ezekiel 1. Look at these angels. Spend a little bit more time on the devil than I intended to. I'm going to blame him. The devil preoccupied me and tore me away. Um, it, you know, it, one of the interesting things when we picture angels uh, is we might picture them in the form of a man, right? Uh, you know, touched by an angel, that type of thing. You got we got Roma Downey going around, or, or you know, Michael Landon and Highway to Heaven and that type of stuff, right? Um, and, and that's fine because we do have them uh, angels taking on the figures of men. We think of going into Sodom, right? And they looked like men, so that that's fine. Uh, we also have kind of the idea of just the. Uh, you know, the lights and the, the little halo and the, the wings going around and what have you. The reality is that angels can be very scary, you know, uh, and very frightening to look at. I mean, think about it. Every time an angel shows up, you know, what's the first, almost the first three words that they tell everybody? Do not fear or do, do not be afraid. You know, well, if you're an angel and you're all pretty and you're lit up and everything, what am I going to be scared of? You know, um, so just kind of some, some interesting, uh, interesting uh, ways that uh, we're looking at uh, or that scripture describes angels. Uh, let's start in Ezekiel chapter one, beginning in verse four. This might be the only one we get to today. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it. And in its midst, something like glowing metal in the midst of a fire. Within it, there were four figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Okay, so far, so good. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like a calf's hoof and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for the form of all their faces, each had the face 
of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right side of the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covering their bodies, and each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. In the midst of the living being, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright and lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to it uh, to and fro like bolts of lightning. Now as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. Their, the appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel, and all four of them had the same form. Their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within another. Okay, so we're going on to the wheels. I just want to go back real quick here, okay, um, because there, there's a part that confuses me with this prophet. I do not know, I obviously do not personally know this prophet. Okay, I don't know him personally. Uh, but if we look at verse 6, the last part of that verse, he says they had human form. I don't know if the prophet was on any type of medication or not, but these are not any humans that I have ever looked at in my life. With four faces and wings and calf hoofs for feet and, and, and all of this. So, uh, I... I but that's one just that Well, let me get mine on. Four faces that there are four different ones. And each has a face. And each has wings. It's that, it, you know. Right, it says like verse 8, under their wings, on their four sides, were human, uh, were human hands. All right, so, so it's difficult so when we look at it, but we know that there's four of them, and it's difficult when we, when we look at it. And I tell you what, next week, there, there have actually been some historical artist renderings of what they may have, have looked like that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in next week to kind of pass around. Probably. Um, yeah, I didn't, get, I didn't get the first bell, but we, and we started a little bit late. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop there. We'll pick up. Uh, we're going to look uh, a little bit at the cherubim, seraphim, the living creatures, and then kind of general, and, and then move on. I'll bring in some of those images. Yeah. Um, You know, in school, in our Revelation class, the uh, the professor he said, "Okay, I want you to read this text about angels, and I want or uh, no about uh, Jesus, and uh, you know, just draw it out. You know, there's some, you know, take some colored pencils, color it in, make it look nice, and everything. And when you when you read the text and you draw, and you've got a sword coming out of a mouth and fire coming out, I sat there and I looked, and I was like, this is something from a, like a a three year old." That's, that's what it looked like by the time I was done with it. No, I'll just bring in the artist renderings, though. <laughs>